So before um, letting Raja start, I'll briefly introduce him. Um, so first we have the history, and I think now we're taking a big step leap forward into the future because Raja is going to talk about very interesting project which actually is being built right now. Um, it's about uh, medicine and uh, medicine falsification, and they're doing very great, uh, really good things. But well, you can explain it better. So the stage is for you, and enjoy. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, can everyone hear me properly? Yep. yep. So, good evening, everybody. Um, how many of you here uh, own cryptocurrencies? Just very quickly. Uh, okay. How many of you are from a pharmaceutical background or <coughs> medical background? One. Okay. So, maybe two. So, um, let me, so uh, I think most of you then are familiar with the difference between uh, the cryptocurrency and the blockchain. And I don't think we need to go into... Y you're not? Okay. Oh, you are. Sorry, I thought you... <laughs> so, um, very quickly, uh, just for some people, blockchain, of course, is the uh, technology behind the cryptocurrencies. And we use blockchain in different ways, and there's different use cases, as Bass was saying. So, um, what Pharma Trust does is we try and prevent this happening. So thi these are examples of counterfeit drugs that you can find. And as you know, um, they're very difficult to tell apart. Now, a lot of you probably don't know much about this because it's not that much uh, in the public eye. And the reason is it's seen as a cost of sale. But unfortunately, up to a million people every year die because of counterfeit drugs. <coughs> now, n most people don't know that statistic, and it's uh, puzzling why we don't have that. The market size that we're dealing with, just very quickly, is $1 trillion. It's $1.3 trillion, the total market for pharmaceutical drugs. Believe it or not, $200 billion of that is counterfeit drugs. These are numbers coming out of the World Health Organization, by the way. Virtual pharmaceutical market is worth around $75 billion a year. Now, Eli Lilly estimates 60% of those drugs bought online are actually counterfeits. The reason being that setting up websites is actually very simple, and copying certificates from legitimate websites is very easy. Um, $80 billion is the annual supply chain mechanism um, market. Now, the numbers we're dealing with are uh, absolutely huge. Um, and there are real issues with counterfeit drugs just behind the numbers. Now, most people say, why is it that the counterfeit drugs, the deaths from these counterfeit drugs uh, are so prevalent? Well, there's a number of different reasons for it. Most um, complex supply chains have issues. The pharmaceutical supply chain is actually very important, but there's other ones as well, such as the food uh, market chain, other retail and fashion goods. But we, of course, only focus on the pharmaceutical supplies. Now, the issue is there's no global unified solution. Everybody's using different technologies. Some companies are using SAP, some are using uh, Oracle or Great Plains, some of their own proprietary systems, and actually not a lot of them are talking to each other. Um, there's also a, a lot of different regulatory regimes. So the US have their own regulatory regime, uh, the EU have their own, and countries like Turkey or uh, Asia, other Asian countries have their own regulatory regimes as well. But the interesting thing is the US this year, by the FDA rules, uh, require all pharmaceutical companies to be able to identify where any particular packet of drugs is. And the EU are following on with that for next year, in 2019. So there's a legal imperative on, pharmace on the pharmaceutical industry to be able to ensure they can track every packet. Um, and there's the industry itself, apart from the $200 billion that I gave you in terms of counterfeit, also suffer from things like return fraud. Um, it varies from country to country. Some estimates put it up to about $3 billion per annum. So um, there is a huge number of issues. 
Now, a lot of people may say, well, hang on, wh why does that matter to us? What's, what's the pharmaceutical uh, industry is huge. But one of the things is it, we are dealing with commercial operations here. So money that's lost to counterfeits or tax uh, losses due to counterfeits, of course, reduces the amount that you can put into research and development to produce w uh, medicines that can help society generally. So what did we do? That was a problem that we've seen. So what was the solution that we tried to look for? Well, there were a number of issues apart, uh, around this industry um, which prevent them coming together. Um, there's lack of trust between various entities. Uh, as I said, there's different technological issues and different regulatory regimes. So we took a holistic view of it and said, how can we make it easy for this industry to adopt something? And then later I'll tell you why we use the blockchain. So what we did was, firstly, we tried to find a way of making it regulatory neutral. A lot of the regulations actually require data. So we focused on how we can work both in the US, EU, or some other uh, country that has jurisdiction issues. Generally, it all comes down to what kind of data that we need to collect. The next stage was, well, how can we make it cross-platform? Because many countries want the industry to work together, but of course there's an expense here. You don't want them to replace their hardware. You don't want them to change their software, or you don't want to impose a particular kind of labeling regime. So we found it easy to be able to bring it all together uh, on the blockchain. And then we actually thought, what can we do to actually advance the need of the pharmaceutical industry? We're collecting all this data. We must be able to do something more than just ensure it's immutable and incorruptible and all the other good stuff that uh, blockchain allows you to do. So we looked at artificial intelligence. How can we help the pharmaceutical industry do things like predictive supplies? Or how can we find most efficient routes to market? Um, and then finally, we wanted to find a way of making it a truly global product. So it's quite easy to work here in the uh, Western world where we can put APIs in people's ERM systems or their servers and collect the data. But what happens if you're in Sudan or the Congo or Vietnam? You know, how do we make it easy for those countries to be able to use our system? So what we found uh, was actually even in some of these emerging economies, there's a big um, use of smartphones. So we thought, let's bring um, some apps to the market. Let's have apps that the commercial entities could use, be it a customs authority, be it a pharmaceutical, or be it a hospital. And at the end, what we wanted to do is, of course, make it an open system. And th that has several advantages. One is any user can, of course, scan a 2D barcode and find out whether it's authentic or whether it's suspicious. But it has other uh, advantages on top of that. It allows you to collect data on various uh, entities, and that, again, helps us uh, to, to work it through. So what, what does our system do? It can give you real-time reporting. Um, again, there's different ways we can configure the system to give the information to the differing clients that we have. Um, and it's a flexible system. So we don't just work for, or we don't want our cli clients just to be pharmaceutical industries. Um, we want to help ministries of health, the ones that subsidize a lot of these drugs. And these drugs go missing, or they become expired, or they're not used efficiently. We want to be able to use the smart contracts functionality on some of these blockchains to do the automatic payments and the tax compliance as well. Um, we want to do automated regulatory reporting. Every year, the burden on the pharmaceutical industry grows because the governments want to ensure the safety of uh, their citizens. And finally, there's automatic uh, audit and artificial intelligence, which I was telling you about. And the simplicity. We kept it very, very simple. Now, everyone wants to, you know, of course, try and make complicated, but we believe you use the technology to keep things very simple. So we have the uh, optimal solution, we believe. I'm not going to go take you through all of this, but we provide basically an insurance to various 
uh, entities throughout the supply chain mechanism, be it the distributors, be it the manufacturers, or be it uh, uh, the governmental agencies. Um, now, where we've got to is we've actually got an, uh, a product, an alpha product, that we are discussing uh, with various entities. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very honoured that I came back from Mongolia, which is actually quite a small country in terms of population, but a large land mass that has recently signed up to uh, trial our system. And we hope this will be followed by other smaller countries. Now, you might say, why are we focusing on smaller countries? Well, it just makes it easier for us to iron out any of the issues with our system and also understand the types of information that governments want, uh, law enforcement want, or NGOs want, uh, and the regulators need. Um, we have quite uh, an unusual uh, management team. Our chairman is uh, uh, Lord Anthony St. John of Leicester. He's a member of the House of Lords, and he also sits on the um, artificial, sorry, the Parliamentary Select Committee on Artificial Intelligence. So he has an interest in, in, in the product that we're doing. Uh, I'm a lawyer by background. I've been in management for, for a number of years, but I'm not a coder. I'm not a developer. Um, the reason I got into this myself was I was reading about smart contracts and how in the future you won't need lawyers anymore. So I thought, oh, this is quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> After, after uh, I researched it and read more about it, I realized that actually smart contracts aren't that smart, and uh, lawyers will always find uh, a way of uh, squeezing you for money. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our CEO, Peter Bryant, he's, um, he's got significant amounts of experience in terms of uh, growing businesses, and our CTO, uh, Shadwaz, he's got a few patents, and he comes from a black blockchain uh, background, and then we've got some more developers and marketing people. So we, we are actually quite advanced as, as a company, and we're quite advanced in terms of the product that we've got and the ones that we're testing. And some of you might say, okay, so what's your difference from other uh, similar environments? Well, one is we only specialize in pharmaceuticals. The whole concept started off as something developing uh, around pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industries. We were never in uh, tracking any other products. We never did trainers, for example, or sneakers, as some of you say. Uh, we've never done food stuffs. We've never done pork bellies. Uh, we've only done pharmaceutical products. Um, the other thing is we're actually edge sensor neutral. We don't want to start trying to innovate or produce edge sensors. And the reason we believe we should stay neutral on it is quite simply because there are better companies, much bigger than us, who are coming up with much more innovative uh, solutions that are available. But we can still track them. That is our only thing. Now, what is this um, leading to? I, I think most of you say, OK, this is blockchain. It's, it's really quite interesting. Personally, I believe blockchain is fundamentally going to change society. Um, and uh, although we laugh about not having lawyers, no trees actually are going to be the first guys to go because the blockchain actually fixes that problem for you already. But there's, I think the banks are going to be in danger, and I think quite rightly so as well because of the abuse of the financial system we've got. But then there's companies like us, Pharma Trust, who are in that really interesting area where automation is coming. So when the factories run themselves, when IoT devices can communicate with each other so, so well, uh, when there are self-driving trucks, when there are self-sailing ships, when there are ports which are run by robots, sometimes things will go wrong, and sometimes regulators need that comfort to ensure that there's a permanent record somewhere that can't be changed to be able to say, OK, this is what went wrong, um, this is how to fix it. And that's what we are going to provide. We're going to be that company that's not around just for the short term, but we're going to be here hopefully for the future by taking this strategic approach, which is uh, technology neutral, mainly a data collection agency, and really getting into the artificial intelligence and uh, the machine learning stuff, which we hope will be the output of where we grow. 
So um, I think I'm not going to take up too much of your time because I know it's uh, a little bit late. Um, that's Pharma Trust. If you've got any questions, I suppose I just, sorry, question directly there. So, uh, yeah. So the way the system works is, uh, as soon as a packet or a label is produced, uh, we start tracking it from that point. So usually nowadays the pharmaceutical industry have contract manufacturers in places like India or Jordan or or, 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 or China. Um, so those labels are now usually 2D or 3D unique labels. Okay, and then we track it from the point of manufacture to the point of consumption, right? So if there's two labels that are the same, the system will automatically flag up a warning that there's an issue here that needs to be investigated. So it's difficult to inflate it because, of course, at the end of the chain, which we don't really get involved with, but exactly. So you go literally from manufacturer, distributor, warehouse guy, port authority, shipping company, etc., etc. So we issue a birth certificate and then a, a death certificate when it's consumed. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you for your question. Yeah. Uh, there are quite a few questions uh, in Q&A session. So what do you need a token for as a first one? Yeah, so thi this is uh, uh, an interesting uh, question. Wh why do we need tokens? I mean, actually, why do we need tokens? There you go. So the, I didn't even have to answer it. That's, uh, <laughs> we have a telegram group and we have a similar thing. People just answer the questions for us. So you're, you're, you're literally, <laughs> we're, we're, we're a utility token. So when you have intelligent people in the room and the, uh, obviously our community, they answer everything for you. But that, that's it. Uh, essentially what we do is each token is used to track a label. So as I said, it's like a little bit like a birth certificate for each uh, particular label that's coming through. Next question, will the centralized and thus better regulated control database be able to do the same? What you aim for to do with the blockchain? So th there are actually countries that uh, do have central databases. I, th I think Turkey is, is a good example of a central database. Now, that works probably very well at a country level. Um, now, and I think the question is, of course, also what's wrong with using a cloud-based system? Now, what we do is, of course, we're using the blockchain to give uh, the public, the government, and the regulators an assurance that nobody in the system is going to change the data or records are going to go missing or timestamps are going to change. Right? So that allows uh, us to build the other layers of the services on a very firm foundation. A central database is, as people have talked about uh, before, have fundamental weaknesses, and hopefully we're getting away from that by using the blockchain. Uh, excuse me, but uh, the live stream, people who are watching live stream, are around 1,500, so they cannot hear you. So either you ask for a mic, or we continue with the questions, or you submit your question on the slider. Thanks. Okay, so how do you ensure false data is not entered at a at the source? So uh, coming back to the contract manufacturers, usually the manufacturing uh, companies are licensed, okay, and the brands like Pfizer's or the GSKs uh, or Johnson and Johnsons, they will certify that that is the manufacturer that they're using, and they're authorized to produce medicines on their behalf. Okay. Then uh, are you running the blockchain on a public blockchain network like Ethereum, or do you have your own private blockchain? Currently, we're using Ethereum because of the flexibility. Uh, the public fork? Well, yeah, so it's public. public. So yeah. it's, 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 it's on the Ethereum network. But we do want to keep this policy, as Bass was saying, because different blockchains are going to evolve over time, that we're blockchain neutral. And there are projects at the moment which hopefully will allow different blockchains to talk to each other. Because ultimately, we want to be 
the, the single app on a user that everyone can use to track the medicines worldwide. Okay, next question, where does AI come in and what's the connection with blockchain? So uh, I may have answered that earlier, but we're using the blockchain as a base, as a data, not as a database, sorry, as a data stamping or a hashing that allows us to give that assurance that the data isn't being changed. The AI sits on top of that as a service. As I said, some of you might know the Toyota just-in-time supply chain model. So basically, you deliver the parts that you need when you need them with at le the least amount of time on the shelf. Now, the massive problem in the pharmaceutical industry, which hasn't got anything to do with counterfeit drugs, is the amount of waste of drugs sitting on shelves that have passed their expiry date or are being held in environmental conditions that they shouldn't. What we would like to do is say, okay, we're going to use AI, and we're going to say to you, look, there's a flu outbreak happening in London. There's no need to have flu vaccines in, say, Amsterdam, right? So we can divert those supplies. And there are Google Analytics that you can sometimes use uh, conceptually which show flu outbreaks actually happening. So they can predict them a few days in advance. And we want to use that kind of technology. There's also uh, machine learning stuff that UPS, some of you may have heard, have done, which, uh, you know, the turn right model in Manhattan, because actually it saves $20 million or something in, in gas. So there's various efficiencies you can do. And those of you that are into data analytics will know data analysis is actually a very useful tool to bring efficiencies to different industries. Okay. Uh, is your code open source or proprietary? Uh, well, we're on the Ethereum, Ethereum network, but uh, we, we yeah. do have parts of it, uh, which is obviously pro propriety. Okay. Then uh, which data is stored direct directly on a blockchain? Uh, small amounts of hash data. Uh, obviously, because we're you, you don't use blockchains. So you are not storing any personal data on blockchain, right? We don't. We don't, as a policy, collect personal data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't understand this question. Then uh, last question: If there are already labels, manufacturers, or already licensed, then how is there still so much fraud? And would your solution actually solve the problem? So um, I, 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 th I think what the question is asking me is, would there be duplicate labels? Or since there's labeling already, why, why is there so much fraud? Well, the labels currently, I think, aren't uh, unique. So somebody could photocopy them. And that's where you get things like return fraud or counterfeit drugs coming into the system. Uh, once the new unique labeling comes in, as I said, we track it at every data point. And it's, so it's difficult for counterfeiters to put in the medicine uh, into the supply chain. Um, there was something I did want to say. I, th I think I saw it. Somebody, some people might say, why would you ever want to actually supply mm. counterfeit drugs? Um, so I'll give you a statistic, uh, and you can look this up on our white paper. It costs 15 cents to uh, make an ecstasy tablet, and you can sell it in a club for around a dollar, from what I understand. <laughs> I, I have heard in uh, I, I have heard in Amsterdam you can even get it quality checked when you get into the club, but um, the uh, uh, but certainly in, in in countries in the UK if you're caught with lots of ecstasy tablets you're in trouble. Um, now it costs around fifteen or twenty cents to actually make Viagra, which is the most uh, counterfeited drug, particularly in Asia. One in five, uh, sorry, one in. 25% are, are actually counterfeit. So, but you can sell it for between $8 and $15. So the margins are much bigger. It's actually better for you to sell counterfeit drugs uh, than the legal drugs. Because if you're caught with a packet of ecstasy in, in say, the UK, you're definitely going to go to jail. If you're caught with a bag of fake Viagra, they're probably likely to laugh at you or, or give you a slap on the wrist. The penalties are different. You know? So this is why actually counterfeit drugs are a big problem and there are organized gangs that supply into uh, the supply chain in very large quantities. Okay, thank you very much for thank your talk, you. Raja. Thank you very much.